I was in my dressing room, basking in that wonderful state that settles in after a successful Saturday matinee and casts a rosy anticipation for the coming evening's performance. Unaware that the feds were about to burst in with some sad story about alien viruses and paranoid telepaths, it's hard to anticipate that kind of thing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I had actually come to Atlanta for a meeting with the owners of a Belgian plastics company marketing custom billiard balls beyond the edges of human space. No, seriously. Six months earlier, an alien tour group had mixed up an address on their itinerary and wandered into a pool hall by mistake. The aliens had gone crazy over the game. The Belgians were seizing the opportunity. Their PR department had decided the best way to market a human product to alien consumers was to show alien buffalo dogs chowing down on their product, but only if they acted quickly. A day of face-to-face -face negotiations on the neutral ground of an Atlanta resort had produced a mutually satisfying contract, and we'd followed that with a day-long vid shoot. The Belgians had transformed our boardroom into a small studio, filling it with a film crew, their gear, and several rented pool tables. For several hours, a pair of actors shot pool, only to have their games interrupted when my buffalo dog, Reggie, leapt upon the tables. His tiny hooves frolicked across the felt in a joyous dance for a few moments, while the director cued me to single him, at which point he devoured several of the brightly colored balls. At the end of the day, Reggie and I had returned to our own suite with a hefty licensing fee and a satchel of leftover billion balls. I wasn't due back in Philadelphia until Monday, and the owner of the resort was an old friend who owed me a favor. She'd been more than happy to squeeze me onto the schedule of one of their stages so I could do a couple hypnosis shows on Saturday. It didn't matter that the check from the Belgians was more than I'd made in my best year as a hypnotist. I missed performing and tried to sneak in a gig where I could. It made the corporate work bearable. My matinee had ended 10 minutes earlier and I'd retired to a spacious dressing room. My tuxedo coat hung on an old-style coat rack in one corner, and I tossed my silk bow tie in the vanity and propped my feet up. I had a few hours to kill before my evening show, plenty of time to order an early dinner from room service, and lob pool balls for Reggie to chase and eat. The NSA had other plans for me. As the nine ball arced across the room, two bruisers slammed through my unlocked door. From their sinister dark glasses to their cheaply tailored black suits, these two could have stepped right off the cover of G-Men's Quarterly. They ignored me completely, barely glanced at Reggie, concerning themselves with staring at their handheld gadgets and scanning the dressing room. Then they took up position on either side of the door, still not acknowledging my presence. The one on the right raised a hand to his ear and spoke into his cuff. A moment later, a short man waddled in. He had black unkempt hair that sprang all around in curls and the kind of dark wild eyes you'd expect in a religious leader, an impression that was only increased by his ill-groomed beard and mustache. He looked right at me. Mr. Conroy, I'm Special Agent Davies. I'm with the National Security Agency. Your government is in need of your unique abilities. A billfold materialized in his hand, briefly unfolded to flash his credentials, and then vanished again. I knew people who'd been doing close-up magic for years who couldn't have done it any smoother. Red warning lights began flashing in my mind. I'm, I'm sorry, Agent Davies, but if the government needs me, they need to go through my agent. Now, if you'll excuse me, I was just about to order some dinner. I reached for the phone, and at a gesture from Davies, one of his goons rushed forward and snatched it out of my hand. Reggie leaped into my lap and growled. I wrapped both my hands around him and held him in place. Please, Mr. Conroy, we're trying to keep this quiet. Strictly need to know. There's nothing I can safely tell your agent that would convince you to see me, so I've simply saved us all some time and come right to you. I kept any reaction on my face and made a point of shifting my attention to my buffalito. Look, if this is about my tax return, the Conroy Institute for Higher Cognition is a legitimate private foundation, the NSA, Mr. Conroy, not the Internal Revenue but I am here about higher cognition. Davies paused. He let the silence linger until I looked up at him. He met my gaze and continued. I assume you've heard of Meyerson's encephalitis B? It's loose. My mouth dropped open and I rocked back in my seat. 
Everyone had heard of Meyerson's, the first and only extrasolar virus to find terrestrial life tasty. It was the worst fear of xenophiles and xenophobes alike, an incontrovertible case of an alien pathogen that could affect us. In the decades since first contact, humanity had been assured over and over not to worry about ailments from space. That changed in a single day five years ago. 117 people in Ohio had been exposed in a restaurant. They all died within two days. The news channels had been full of the story for weeks. That's impossible, I said. You you can't contract Meyerson's. Only from a prepubescent Andromedan. And the CDC doesn't allow any Andromedans out of quarantine if they're that young. Davies grimaced. It was a senior researcher at the CDC who was contaminated. Dr. Jaya Surya. He'd been working with the virus since the original outbreak. He had an accident in his lab and lost containment of a sample. No one else was infected, and he isolated himself immediately. So how is this a matter for government agents? Davies cleared his throat. <clears throat> I was called in three days later. His fever broke, and he escaped the, the facility. Escape? Uh, no, wait, you said three days? I read that Meyerson's burns out a human brain within 48 hours. It does, Mr. Conroy, or rather it has in 117 of the 118 cases thus far. Dr. Jayasuriya had been working on a cure. Maybe he found it. Or more likely the virus infecting him has mutated. It didn't kill him, and so far it hasn't spread beyond him. He encountered more than a dozen people during his escape, and thus far none shows any signs of infection. I affected a fictional nonchalance for the mutated alien virus the CDC had let loose in a city I just happened to be visiting. Davies seemed to be having a hard time keeping his story straight. So, what's your problem? You've got a non-contagious researcher roaming around Atlanta? Your FBI boys uh, can't round him up? NSA, Mr. Conroy, not FBI. And while possible contagion is still a concern, we have a larger problem. Ignorance. Ignorance? There are too many unknowns in play, and we've exhausted the CDC's ability to even ask the right question. Reggie had started fidgeting, picking up on my growing anxiety. I picked up a billiard ball and fed it to him to calm him down. To Davies, I said, you don't know what you don't know. Essentially. And what we do know potentially exacerbates what we don't. We believe the virus has altered Jaya giving him the ability to escape from a state-of-the-art confinement facility. What kind of ability lets a person do that? I asked. Mental ability, Mr. Conrad. Jaya Surya has become the most powerful telepath on record. <laughs>